Welcome to the Inside the Sales Playbook show, where on each and every episode, we dive into the actual sales processes, the plays, the strategies working for fast-growing teams today. No high-level overview. We get into the weeds of what some of the fastest-growing and most successful sales teams are doing today to drive revenue and grow their businesses. And we've got two sponsors on the show today. The first is SalesKit. SalesKit takes the guesswork out of scaling your sales knowledge all in one great repository. No more do you have to put your sales knowledge in Google Drive drives, in Dropbox folders, in various other files and formats. SalesKit makes it easier than ever for your team to access the sales knowledge that they need right at their fingertips. Sign up for a free trial today at GetSalesKit.com. And we're also sponsored by my book, Raise Your Standards, The Definitive Guide to Building Seven-Figure Sales. You can get a free copy of the book to help grow your sales, whether you're an entrepreneur, a sales leader, or a sales contributor at GetSalesKit.com forward slash book. I'm your host, Mark Evans, and today I'm really fired up for this conversation. I first heard this co-founder uh, speak on the Nathan Latka podcast, big fan of that show, um, and just really impressed with their growth, with their diversity of customers. So I've got Mr. Kevin Davidovitz, uh, president and co-founder of Coach Me Plus. Kevin, welcome to the show. Yeah, good to meet you, Mark. Hey, so so good to have you on. Kevin is in from Buffalo, which, of course, in the midst of one of the biggest snowstorms on the East Coast, uh, he's got little to no snow. We're just going to say no snow at all. But uh, Kevin, <laughs> for those that have not heard of Coach Me Plus, how about you give the listeners a little bit of context? What is Coach Me Plus, and how do you help your clients achieve their mission? So basically, we are a remote fitness platform to help coaches and athletes achieve their fitness and related goals, uh, fitness and health related goals. Um, you know, it's a, uh, it's a way to really enhance the relationship between the coach and the athlete, which we feel is the most successful way to reach any kind of, uh, fitness goal that you might have. Um, and we do that through a technology that, uh, integrates, you know, wearable, uh, device tech, um, you know, different applications for the user. So you have an application for the athlete and you have an application for the coach or the trainer. And uh, all that goes into a very large enterprise platform that can be configured for usability based on uh, the client or the market need. That's awesome. I'm, that It's a really cool concept. And I want to dig into that a little bit more. But mm-hmm. let's kind of start in the beginning. You're a talented guy. You went to design school. You've got your MBA. Of all the things you could have done and all the things you have started or been a part of, why the heck did you choose this? And uh, tell us a little bit about your story there. Yeah, I mean, obviously, most uh, most startups have that passion, you know, play to it, right? And and, mm-hmm. and certainly mine did as well. Uh, you know, I was a high school uh, football player, hockey player, um, spent a lot of time in the gym and and did a lot of tracking of our, our workouts that we had on, on paper. Um, we, uh, my, my co-founders, Stephen uh, Ostro and, and my brother, Michael uh, Davidovich, also were working in a, um, we had a you know, kind of a services business, right? We were doing websites and, and CD-ROMs and things like that in the early 2000s. And uh, one of the strength conditioning coaches from the Buffalo Sabres had gotten a hold of one of our CD-ROMs, asked us, can you put some videos on there for workouts and things like that? You know, our, my guys go away for the off season. Can we, you know, communicate uh, instead of doing everything on paper? So yeah, we did that. Built the first CD, super easy, and and understood the context really well because you know uh, all of us had played sports uh, at one time or another. So uh, you know, ran that out and did that for a couple of years before uh, we really decided that this was something that we wanted to focus on and said goodbye to the service industry and and now we're doing this uh, now we're doing this full time. So it became an online platform in two thousand. Lemonish, okay. and uh, you know, landed a couple of uh, NHL teams, uh, NFL teams, and just kind of took off from there. That's awesome. I love hearing the fact that you started in 2011 and even before then, right? Working and progressing towards this goal. Because I think one of the things people, at least now, right, post COVID 2000, well, post, during, whenever, maybe this will be done, maybe it won't. But right when you hear remote fitness program, a lot of people may jump to think, well, they probably started that in you know late March of 2020. But no, you've been at this for almost going on now a full decade or so. Um, has that been a uh, source of concern? Or has that been like, a, I don't know, something that's bothered you at all? Have you gotten any so, that sort of feedback seeing all these people jump into this remote fitness space? Um, so here's the the way that we've always seen it play out was, you know, the professional sports space and, and high end universities that we worked with in the beginning, were always going to be the leader, you know, bleeding edge of, of, of the industry. And you would get that chasm, right? You know, you're worried about the early adopters and then eventually the rest of the market catches on. 
And we had false started a few times between, you know, 2013 and now to really push for the fitness space with mixed results. And the, the, the really, you know, the, the opportunity that laid out before us in the past, you know, 12 months or so kind of fell in line with our most recent uh, attempt at this again. So we had just launched a, a new series of packages and bundles in uh, late 2019 to start off in January of 2020. And, you know, the entire fitness industry has completely accelerated its, its evolution into, into this, you know, omni-channel sense of fitness um, mm-hmm. in, in, in this pandemic. So, you know, we, we don't see many of the threats that you would if we had started our company in February or March, you know, then I'd be, I'd be like a little shaken at to, at how, you know, how do you go after this? Um, our experience in the pros and our experience of working with um, larger organizations has given us uh, insights into how to leverage all of that stuff that we've been doing for decade into, you know, uh, best practice for uh, smaller uh, bundles and packages that can quickly turn into, you know, stickiness and, and uh, revenue generation for, for gyms. Yeah, I'm sure it's been interesting to see, or at least it's interesting from my perspective, to see the fitness industry really evolve too from before, uh, you know, it was like getting in men's health was really the big thing. And now it's an Instagram following, right? If you have 10,000 followers, you can have basically your own nutraceuticals line, or you can have your own, basically, (laughs) right, your own protein powder. Uh, Has that changed how you've approached the market or how you've sold into this market at all? Well, you know, we have a media, we, our, our company's core, you know, group has experience in media for, for a long, long time. Um, you know, like I said, doing CD-ROMs and websites and things like that yeah. in the 2000s, you know, we were doing banner ads before, you know, Google was, was built on being a media company. It was, yeah. uh, we we're doing stuff for double click and things like that. So we've always been at the forefront of understanding which platform is going to work best so, you know, TikTok comes out, Instagram comes out, Twitter comes out, like they're just evolutions of the same, you know, kind of process. And that's, you know, brand recognition, uh, delivering a message and then capturing that message and, and turning it into, into customers. Uh, the techniques just become a little bit different. So um, whatever the next media, you know, uh, major piece is going to be after TikTok, we'll be ready for it because that's, that's our, it's, it's in our DNA. Yeah, so it sounds like the fundamentals don't change. Like, right, you follow the same marketing and advertising fundamentals, and good things will follow. Uh, yeah, and it's kind of funny because you'll see techniques that were, you know, popular on late night, you know, infomercials in the '80s, yeah. still being used, and you know, pops up in TikTok, and you're just like, oh, come on, like that's, <laughs> you know, that's old school right there. So you'll mm-hmm. you'll see some you'll see some stuff that uh, that gets old and then comes comes back to being new again. Yeah, and those same uh, late night infomercial people, they stole that from Eugene Schwartz and from oh, Claude yeah. Hopkins back in the 30s and 40s with scientific Absolutely. advertising. So the cycle just always repeats itself. And uh, I love I love picking up old newspapers or old magazines. Yeah. We, we bought this old house. So we live in an old Victorian in, in, in South Buffalo. And uh, there was, you know, newspapers from the 30s and 40s and 50s in there. And, you know, it's the same thing. New and improved, uh, you know. <laughs> while supplies last, yeah. Limited yeah, quality, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Get, get it, get it while it's before it's gone, and yeah. just all this, you know, urgency in your in your language and things like that. And it's uh, it's just funny to look at, you know, the. Uh, it's always been there. It's always just been mm-hmm. there. Yeah. Well, let's transition a little bit because I'm really curious to get into your sales team. You've got four sales team members. You've got one consultant. Um, so walk me through kind of, you know, one of the things everybody's wanted to talk about is, all right, how do we reduce ramp time? How do we increase the quality of training, especially now with remote training and distributed sales workforces? So what is your onboarding and training process look like specifically for salespeople? And what are some elements of it that you think you do better than most? So we start, most of our uh, sales folks have started off on the enterprise level of the sales process. So we have gone personnel first and then process driven Mm -hmm. later and layering in technology actually to improve, um, you know, the efficiency of the sales cycle. So instead of um, leading with a, you know, we're going to go with this CRM, we're going to go with this process, we're going to drive these factors and else like that. We believe that the the cycle begins and ends with the person who's actually talking to you, you know, once you've actually gotten to that relationship, we like to build, you know, build on that relationship. So all of our sales um, uh, professionals have relationship building skills. And we really like to focus on, you know, making sure that they can build rapport, making sure that they can actually 
identify the problem, listen with both ears, and really understand exactly what it is that we're trying to solve with the customer. Um, me personally, I'm you know I'm invested because it's my company, so I I, I, I drive sales on the enterprise level. Uh, same with uh, my partner Teo, like he he's very focused on you know, making sure that these enterprise and higher level uh, agreements that we work through um, get the care and nurture that they need to actually to go through the process. The gym and other um, sales that we're going for now, uh, Sean is one of our uh, sales guys down there. He's a former gym owner. Like he can't be more intimate with the problem and understanding exactly what the needs are of, of a facility manager and trying to get, you know, the, the most bang for their buck and, and drive revenue into the facility. So that is really important to us is, mm -hmm. is building relationships first. Now you start from there and you begin to build the process around that. And that gets into capturing leads, you know, from, um, you know, media activities and things like that, and, and really pushing that through whatever CRM or conversion funnel pl you know, platform we happen to be using. And we've gone through three of them. <laughs> What's the latest one you're on? Uh, we, we just went back. We, I'd say back to, but we just went to HubSpot. Okay. Great. Um, so we, yeah, it's kind of funny. We started off with Salesforce. You get the, you get the Cadillac. Mm -hmm. uh, then you realize that you only need like this much of the seat. So we, we've got this monster that we really aren't <laughs> getting the most value out of. Not only that, but then we figured out that a lot of our internal processes we wanted to have as part of a core functionality of our of our software. So, usage patterns, um, you know, click throughs in the software had to be part of our reporting process. So we went to an in in house CRM. We went with Sugar Sugar CRM, yeah. um, and and put uh, Sweet CRM on top of that, which is a nice little you know UI UX uh, tool on top of that system. And basically now we can let, you know, I can look at usage reports. I can understand what parts of our system are being used, where people are getting stuck in the platform. So if they mm -hmm. come in, they go here, you know, they're not using it as well. Like we can actually identify that person and help them through some of their issues um, and, and kind of built, built off of that. Because we had that, we now have the um, ability to go back to something like HubSpot, which we you know just did recently, I'd say this quarter. That allows us to supercharge some of the, you know, automation cycles and things like that, because they can then build on top of that foundation element that we have. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you go to your standard, you know, uh, touch point pre pre sale, right? Like somebody mm -hmm. comes in, um, you're, you're capturing their information, you're trying to find out as much as possible. So you can drive like really direct message and messaging to them. And then you try to get them in front of one of our uh, individuals as, as quickly as possible. We do have the way we do have an ability for them to go off and just purchase the software themselves, which mm -hmm. we enjoy because then you know it's just like okay, yeah. great, you're you're self served and you're 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 moving along and you you got exactly what you need. Um, but uh, you know we do find that a lot of people are curious and they want to get behind you know what's what's actually happening in the nuts and bolts of the software. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, you know that's kind of where we end up. Now, are the majority of your leads coming from inbound or are they coming from outbound efforts or referral base? We've completely flipped the script. Everything was outbound when we okay. first started, right? Like mm -hmm. it was just like relationship building, going to trade shows, being in people's, you know, buildings as yeah. much as you can actually going out there. And that's easy when you're talking to 122 professional sports teams yeah, or, <clears throat> you know, 50 major D1, you know, university programs yeah sure you can go to the trade show and you can talk to people it's a real defined uh, market there yeah yeah but now i'm going after three hundred fifty thousand personal trainers Ooh, that's a lot yeah can't knock on those doors yeah so so we've had to really under you know we've had to really um be uh deliberate and delicate about our positioning in our messaging to go out for those um for those types of customers and Last year, 2019, I did 40, let's just say 40 trips, trade show trips, you know, traveling and everything else like that. So I was on the road all of the time last yeah. year. This year I was on the road once and that was very early oh. in, um, you know, very early in the year. And it's, uh, you know, everything has to be inbound now. So we, you know, ramped up the conversion process. We understand exactly what the process is for um, you know, getting somebody in the door, walking them through, uh, training them, educating them and everything else like that. And all of our, uh, almost all of our sales are exclusively inbound now. 
Nice. How do you make sure that the message is consistent from your sales team, right? You seem like a very marketing focused, very like you know what you want from a marketing perspective and how you want the product to be articulated as well. So how do you ensure that there's consistency amongst your sales team? So we do daily scrums, much like a development mm-hmm. team would. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a stand up, 15 minute stand up every day. Uh, everybody comes in and, you know, we share our, our war stories, blockers, you know, next steps, issues with, um, with our uh, support. I mean, just basically anything that might be an issue, right? Like there's nobody out yeah. there just going off on a lone wolf and doing it themselves. And is this so just that- sales team only? Only sales team members are allowed? Okay. And now are you still doing it on Zoom or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody comes in uh, and, you know, it's traditional, traditional scrum is like you stand up, you, you don't want to spend more than 15 minutes, you lay out your issues, clear them out, and then move on. And that has worked amazingly well because if somebody is having a, a question about um, a value proposition, a, you know, something that's going to help them uh, communicate more effectively, like what uh, what's, what's going to be helpful, maybe a new feature came out or yeah. an improvement to, to existing soft, you know, systems. If we're not constantly talking to each other about that, then it's going to get lost. And mm-hmm. the lone wolf, the lone wolf guy is just going to say, Oh yeah, it does everything. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Everything. Like mm-hmm. you can't have that. So we, we try to stay on message. We try to stay on point. We always try to make sure that we're doing that, um, um, you know, over deliver under promise kind of mentality. Cause we've had, you know, I've had salespeople on, on the team that have gotten over their skis and they're just like, yeah, you know, like it does everything. Sure. We can say yes. And, and then you're playing catch up behind the scenes and, and, you know, loading up the support team with extra issues instead of, you know, solving that stuff first. So we really do try to do, uh, to do that. And, um, other techniques that we lay in too, is we will, uh, we have a, um, quarterly like review of like all of our language, all of our value props, all of the things that we're really trying to nail down and make sure everybody's on the same point. Does sales um, come to that <laughs> quarterly checkpoint as well? Or is that just like you and the other founders and marketing? That is sales. That's every cool. team, every, yeah, every team in our, in our org does that. And there's, you know, a lot of cross, it's, it's not a very large team. So you do get a lot of cross crossover from other teams, mm-hmm. but um you know, we have to be held accountable to what we're doing and the messaging that we're putting out there. So we really do try to focus on um, making sure everybody's on the same page and on the same point. Yeah, I really, really like that. I think that's awesome. Kevin, sounds like you have a really dialed in sales team. One quick question uh, before we transition into the to the final five. Uh, so, you know, we were talking about this uh, before we hit record. You're currently working with the Navy as well as the Air Force. Give some advice to someone who's trying to or is looking at selling into those large organizations, right? The biggest organizations in the entire world. Um, what's your advice for someone wanting to sell into company organizations like that? So, I mean, basically like all of the rules apply that you get when, when you, whenever you read any kind of sales book and they start laying out things like, you know, roadblocks and stakeholders and, you know, the surprise stakeholder and, and understanding the value proposition and getting the budget in line and getting the, the budget, the customer and the, you know, the need in alignment so that you actually can, can move everything forward. And the government is, I mean, the, the, I think these are the reason that these books have been written <laughs> and these, these things are in place is because that, that is the way that it's, that that's the way that it is. And, you know, some people naturally sell that way in a much smaller setting. If you're, yeah. if you're in a half hour phone call with somebody, you're kind of, you're talking to the stakeholder. You're, mm-hmm. you're you know, you, you know, you're, you're going through the value proposition. That person's also holding the budget and that person's also, you know, really commanding what the, what the need is. And if you're talking to a one or, you know, one person company that's, you can solve those problems quickly, um, through, through conversation and, and through one or two phone calls with the government, it is a multi-team effort and it is a long sales process, um, because your representative in the organization is your voice within the organization. Yeah. So not only do you need to convert that person into an advocate, but you also need to provide them material with materials and messaging that's on point to, break down the barriers for the next stakeholder so that they can actually say yes to your uh, point of contact and your advocate. So um, that those are, those are the key messages. The one thing I love about the government, and this is something that we had wished would have happened in professional sports is that you build that advocacy or you build that rapport with your, with your main, like, you know, your business decision maker at a pro sports team. 
Well, that person isn't there very long because the minute that a quarterback throws an interception, everybody gets fired. <laughs> new you're staff comes in. Yeah. yeah, new staff comes in, and then you're, you're doing the whole process all over again. In the government, there is a very like there is a line of you know process to replace your person with the next person and carry over programs between that. And for anybody who's process driven or process minded, it's it's a dream because you'll lose. Oh yeah, you'll lose your your technical point of contact, and you're just like, oh my god, I just spent a year with this guy. But it's fine because the next person who comes in has been briefed, understands it, the motivations behind, and they're driving the program forward because of all of the groundwork that's been laid before them. So it's a much less stressful um, environment once you get into it, but the time to get there is quite long. Another point, and this is a, a lesson to learn, is to take as many early wins as possible mm. to prove value, prove efficacy, whatever whatever it is that you're trying to get done in as many small yeses as possible, mm. knowing that the end goal will be you know, whatever, whatever the, 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 the end contract is, because if, if you walk into the relationship thinking, well, the government's got all the money in the world, yeah. it, it, they should say mm-hmm. yes to my billion dollar idea. Yeah. Yeah, they will in 10 years. And mm-hmm. it's going to take all, yeah. you know, 1500 yeses to get there. Yeah. Prove but it. if you, exactly. And if you, if you think that you're going to walk in with, with that, you know, sale or that mindset or whatever it might be. And you know, the first couple of no's or first couple of breakdowns, happen then you're you're just never going to be successful in sales in the government yeah so really play the long game i like that i like that a lot that's great advice kevin let's close here with the final five so these are five rapid fire questions i'll ask him you answer you ready yeah let's go all right let's do it favorite sales related movie Oh, uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Ross. Gary, Glenn Ross. Yep. Classic. Okay. Everybody's right. Yeah. Oh, ABC. <laughs> it's a good one. Always yeah. be Always it be is a good one. Favorite sales book. Uh, I just finished a challenger, um, sale, which isn't my favorite sales book, but it's my favorite sales book right now. Love it. Okay. What do you know now that you wish you would have when you first got into sales and business? Oh, to, um, to build process around personality. You know, there's a lot of people who have charisma and then, and, and can walk into a room and kind of just charm a room. But if they're not driving a process behind that, then they've just simply made a couple of friends. Mm, great advice. Great, great advice. Best purchase of 2020 under a hundred dollars doesn't have to be business related. <clears throat> oh, um, my earbuds were a little bit more than that, so I can't say that. Uh, wow, I don't really have one. I, I, I've been I've been kind of cheap this year. Well, let's go with earbuds. <laughs> I like that. Let's go with earbuds. Uh, and is there a uh, executive or is there someone in social media that you're paying close attention to and you really like their content? <clears throat> There's quite a few, and I, I I keep going back to this that the the whole idea of like the celebrity CEO has kind of taken over. Mm -hmm. Um, I really want to make sure that people that I'm following have content behind their words. So I I really try to to strive for that. So, you know, Gary V is interesting, but you know, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff there that's like, well, you know, is that, is that a real thing or is that just his hobby? Um, uh, but somebody like somebody who just gets, gets stuff done, you look at Musk or something Mm -hmm. like that. You're just like, man, this guy just, he gets in the weeds and he, he's an engineer, but he's also a big, you know, vision Mm -hmm. guy. And I mean, how can you, you how can you not? Uh, yeah. Love that. Yeah, I agree with that. Well, I'll put both of those down. Kevin, if our listeners want to connect with you, where's the best place for them to do so? LinkedIn is is probably the best way. Okay, awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Kevin Davidovitz with Coach Me Plus. Kevin, thanks so much for taking us inside your sales playbook. This was an awesome conversation. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Appreciate it.